everybody. Um, whenever I interrupt my colleagues who are having a meeting, I always uh, come out with a phrase. So I'm going to put that in as my suggestion for the title to Jim Mellon's book, which is I always stick my head in the door of the meeting and go, I wouldn't do it like that. <laughs> Whatever it is they're doing, just to try and disconcert them. So I think that will be my guess. Um, I'm going to talk this morning uh, about how uh, we manage money at Fundsmith and why we manage money that way. Uh, and about emerging markets in terms of the problems I think that people have encountered investing in them, uh, what the opportunity might be there, and possibly a better way of approaching it over time. I've put up the disclaimer there, uh, which we're required to put up, which uh, hopefully some of you may have read while I'm speaking. Uh, I always paraphrase a man called Jim Craigie when I put up the disclaimer. He's an American uh, chief executive of a company called Church and Dwight, who make uh, arm and hammer toothpaste, uh, amongst other things. And he uh, paraphrases the disclaimer on his talks by saying, if you believe what I'm saying and buy my shares, it's your problem. So I'll leave you with that thought. Um, the genesis of what I'm about to tell you is uh, in 2003, when I was running a business called Colin Stewart, uh, we acquired a company called Tullet Liberty. It's now called Tullet Prebon, and I'm the, the chief executive there. Uh, when we acquired that company, it had a, a defined benefit pension plan that had a big deficit. Not a particularly unusual situation, but uh, still a troubling one. It was one that we knew when we took the company over, so we weren't surprised. As you can see from that slide, I've got my pointer here, it had 60 million of assets, 90 million of liabilities and about a 30 million deficit. The absolute numbers don't sound all that huge, uh, but a 30 million deficit on 90 million of liabilities is a pretty large number, I can assure you. Uh, now, 10 years later, by 2013, you'll see that the assets had grown to 226 million. There, yeah. The liabilities had also grown. For those of you who are unfamiliar with pension fund accounting, that's quite normal. Those liabilities are the estimates of the pensions that will one day need to be paid. So they're discounted to present value. So as the years tick by, that number automatically goes up because the discount weight that unwinds on them. But you can see by the end of 2013, I'm pleased to say we had a healthy surplus. Now, how did we achieve that? Well, before I tell you, the most important thing we didn't do was put any significant amount of additional money into the fund. The performance of the assets is what got us to turn this pension fund around. Uh, basically, what we did is we fired the actuary, the investment advisor, and the fund manager. Always a good start when something's not going right, in my view. Um, and we appointed a new investment advisor, me. I've been the investment advisor of this fund since the end of 2003, and we set up on a, on a radically different strategy to the way that uh, most people run money, which was a long-only portfolio, so no hedging, no shorting, uh, of just 20 really good companies, and I'll, I'll come back to what I mean by a good company, with an attempt at a buy-and-hold strategy. In terms of performance, I've given you some, a battery there of benchmarks to compare what we did versus uh, how the world did during that period. You'll see that the Morgan Stanley Capital International World Index, the MSCI index there, in sterling with dividends reinvested, so comparable to the pension fund completely, from the day when I took over, which was the 4th of December 2003, to the end of 2013 compounded at 7.86% per annum. The Morgan Stanley E for index, excluding America, 7.82% per annum. The FTSE, you can see they did a bit better. The FTSE, just over 8% per annum. The long bond in sterling did 6%. Short bond did 2.5%. We compounded at 14.87%, nearly 15% per annum during the period, before all costs, uh, and nearly 14% per annum after all costs. Uh, now, it's for you and others to judge, frankly, in the end, not for me to judge, but I think that's a pretty good performance, basically. Uh, you can see we have a number of holdings. We've never held more than 20 companies. And in fact, on a number of occasions, it's gone down to 19 uh, when we've lost a company in a takeover and had to find a new holding. Uh, the other statistic that I think is interesting on that page is the last one. Portfolio turnover average 3.2% per annum. Now, if you're good at mental arithmetic, if we had 20 holdings most of the time, 20 divided into 100 is five. So if we'd changed one of those 20 holdings each year during that decade, our portfolio turnover would be 5% per annum. So what that's telling you is we changed approximately one share every other year, basically. And I can tell you about half the changes we made were involuntary. They were caused by takeovers where we lost the share that we were holding to another company. Um, our pace of dealing was positively glacial. 
it, it's, uh, as I'm always fond of saying, it would be a black armband day for the broking industry if everybody ran money this way. Uh, but of course, everybody won't run money this way. Uh, so it will continue. So that's the foundation of what we did. Um, why did we do that? I'm just going to run through a few points, which basically were what we thought were wrong with the way that that fund was being run. And I think they actually apply to a large part of the active fund management industry. Point one, most funds have become closet index trackers. Uh, the fund managers don't see the biggest threat to their career or their, their salary and bonus as losing you the investor money. They see it as differing from their peers. If they fail conventionally alongside everybody else and everybody performs badly, what does it matter? They don't get fired. And the easiest way of accomplishing that is they basically buy a, a set of shares which fairly closely match the index. They become closet index trackers. What you end up getting most of the time as investors is the index performance as a result, but minus their fees. That's why the vast majority of active managers underperform the index. And if you don't take anything else away from my talk today, if you don't want to invest with Fundsmith or you don't want to invest the way that Fundsmith uh, invests, that's absolutely fine. But I can tell you this, just go buy yourself an index fund. It's the easiest way, I think, to avoid the problems that I'm describing. People say it's a bit ironic, given that I run an active fund, that I recommend that. But for the vast majority of people, the vast majority of the time, an index fund is the right way to go. Um, funds are too diversified. They own too many shares. Uh, people know that portfolio diversification is a good thing. They've heard that. A man called Harry Markovitz got a Nobel Prize for, uh, for doing the theory on it. Um, but like a lot of concepts in finance, people don't read the detail on it. They just know, oh, portfolio diversification. There are certain things that Mr. Markovitz didn't say uh, and that need to be borne in mind. That curve, which is one I could produce for almost any market in the world, any major market, has the number of stocks in a portfolio on the horizontal axis here, and up the, on the vertical axis, it has risk. That's covariance, for those of you who are statistically minded. The likelihood that your portfolio will vary from the market. And you can see, if you have a one-stock portfolio there, you've got a pretty high chance of varying from the market. I mean, fairly obviously. But as you increase the number of stocks in your portfolio, that risk comes down. But please note this. It doesn't come down in a linear fashion. The cur it comes down in an exponential fashion. As you add shares, you quickly lose that covariance risk. And by the time you get out about here, you've achieved all the diversification benefits you're ever going to achieve. So when you look at portfolios that people are running with 85 or 100 or so stocks, they don't need that to achieve diversification. The more you put on out here, you don't get very much more diversification benefit. But what you do get as you own more shares is you get some disbenefits from owning more shares. Fairly obviously, I can know more about 25 shares if I study 25 shares than I can if I study just 50 shares or if I study 100 shares, which would come out over there, I presume, somewhere. And I've never come across a theory of investment that says you're more likely to make money the less you know about something. And I don't think I'm ever going to. Uh, so that's one of the disbenefits that you get from widely diversified portfolios. Fund managers trade too much. Um, the, uh, the FCA, the regulator, in their last analysis said the average portfolio manager turns over his or her portfolio 80% per annum. I find that shocking, that they actually think that they've got better ideas for four-fifths of their portfolio in any given year. Uh, we calculate the cost of an average trade, a round-trip buy-and-sell trade, uh, in the mid-market uh, in the UK as being about... 1.8%, that's uh, including the stamp duty, which is 50 bips, a half percent. So if there's no stamp duty, if it's not a UK share, maybe closer to 1.3%. You may not think that's the cost you're incurring, but that's because you're not taking account of these two big things in the middle. The bid offer spread that you're paying quite often and the price impact of your dealing, particularly if you're a fund manager and you're dealing in large lots. When you buy, you send the price up. When you sell, you send the price down. Um, so if they're turning over 80% of their portfolio, and that's the average cost of a, a total buy-sell trade, they're incurring a cost of 80% of that per annum, so about 1.4%, as I've set up there somewhere, you know, 1.4%. And um, uh, that's a hidden cost to your portfolio. As many times as I try to explain this, I always find a large section of the audience didn't get it. When you're looking at the cost of people managing money for you, you quite often co concentrate on the annual management charge, the AMC. That's not included in it. Or sometimes you go to the old TER, the total expense ratio, as it was, what's now called the OCF, the ongoing charges figure. It's not included in that either. Most people don't disclose this, but it's a real cost to you of the management of your portfolio. The only thing that can supply you with the gains you seek are the share price appreciation of shares and the dividends that they provide. This is a deduction from that before the money gets to you.
it's a real cost. So people trade too much. Um, people also charge too much. Um, one of my particular bugbears is performance fees. People will tell you they align interest having performance fees. I'm afraid that's not true. Uh, I always make the same offer to any audience who believe that, which is, if you think performance fees align interest, if, if you all have a, a whip round uh, while I'm speaking uh, and give me the cash, I'll go to the casino on the way home and play blackjack, and I'll give you 80% of the winnings. Uh, our interests are aligned. No, they're not, because when I lose, which is what I'll actually do, I'm losing your money, not mine. It's, a, it's an asymmetric thing. I get 20% of any upside, you get 100% of any downside. No, the only thing that can ever align interests is if we're both invested in exactly the same piece of paper. That's the only thing that can ever do it. Uh, which, by the way, I am in Fundsmith. I've got over £40 million in my own fund. But my particular bugbear with performance fees is how much of any gains that they absorb. You hear people say, well, it's all right. It's only 20% of the gains. It doesn't sound bad, does it? Um, I'm sure you've heard of Warren Buffett, who, who runs Berkshire Hathaway. If you'd been uh, fortunate enough to invest with him in June 1965 when he took over and put $1,000 into Berkshire shares, uh, by now, as you can see, or now, the end of 2013, you'd have had nearly $7 million. Uh, it's a pretty impressive performance. Uh, nearly 20% per annum compound. Nobody is, has really ever bettered it. Um, now, Warren is co-invested with you. Warren owns shares in Berkshire. You can own shares in Berkshire. He doesn't charge any fees. I think he charges like $100,000 director's fees per annum, which is nothing. Um, what if instead he'd set this up like a hedge fund and he charged 2% of assets and a 20% of any gains? It's okay. It's only 20%, isn't it? You'd have got 80% of those wonderful returns. Now, um, I'm going to risk a bit of audience participation this morning. Uh, what I've done is uh, I've set up on that chart how you would have fared if Warren had set up Berkshire Hathaway just like the hedge fund industry with him charging you 2% of assets and 20% of any gains. One of those two lines that I've drawn on there is what Warren would have out of the $7 million, and the other line is what you would have out of the $7 million. So you've got to think about that for a moment. And there's the answer. The, the blue line is you and the red line is Warren in these circumstances. Your $1,000 would have turned into about $700,000, and Warren's would have turned into $6.3 million. That's what performance fees do to your gains. If any of you want that data, if you send me an email, I'll send you back my spreadsheet that I compiled myself from the Berkshire Hathaway Annual Report. I meet people from the institutional investment world who don't believe that's true. That's what this will do to your money. I'm going to say this. You should never pay performance fees. Uh, the bottom line, unsurprisingly, is performance suffers. If you look there at uh, a couple of statistics we've given, uh, there are 91% of global equity funds. I've only chosen global equity funds because it's the sector that my fund is classified in. 91% of global available sale in the UK have either underperformed their benchmark or failed to survive during the, the 15 years to the end of 2012. It's not very good, is it? Basically, given that nine, over 90% of them are going to fail to hit the benchmark, which is the index, that's why I say to you, just buy the index. It's cheaper, and you'll get a better result. Um, hedge funds returned an average of 7.4% in 2013, according to Standard & Poor's. It's basically 23% uh, below the, uh, the market uh, performance during that, during that period, and more importantly, the fifth straight year of underperformance by hedge funds. Hedge funds have become a means of describing a remuneration structure. Uh, not a means of obtaining performance. Um, there's one thing that's worse than all of this. As much as we can blame uh, fund managers, we should also blame ourselves. As investors, we're particularly bad. There's a few uh, factoids on there for The average US mutual fund over the last 20 years, according to John Kay, uh, who writes for the FT, wrote a book called The Long and Short of It, has earned a return 7% below the market. That's not very good, is it? Because of poor performance, yes, we've spotted that. Fees, yes, we've spotted that. And the, the, the investor, the average investor, is, and their own poor timing. We as investors are particularly brilliant at buying at the top and selling at the bottom. Right? So-called market timing, uh, attempting to pick bottoms or tops or get somewhere close to them, there are only two types of investor. Those who can't do it and those who don't know that they can't do it. You're safer if you're in the former camp, basically. Uh, between two, this, I love this one. Between 2000 and 2010, the best performing US mutual fund was a fund called CGM Focus, which compounded annually 18% per annum during that decade. Pretty good. The average investor in that fund lost 11% per annum. That's, how do you do that? I mean, you, people said to me, how do they do that? Because people are continually exiting the fund at, at bottoms and buying back into it at tops. Um, 
And then this last bit, we buy and sell too often. 2000, the, uh, uh, this study by uh, Brad Barber and Terence O'Dean studied the trading performance of 60,000 retail investors uh, with accounts at a discount broker. Uh, the index returns 17.9% a year. The investors who traded most returned 11.4% a year. Trading frequently, what you're taught is trading frequently, instantaneous information, and so on, is your friend. It's your enemy. It is absolutely your enemy. Inactivity is your friend. Um, there's a study I like that illustrates this in a book called The Invisible Gorilla. And it's a book about um, uh, psychology of, of investment, behavioral finance. And it describes a computer exercise in which they try and simulate a lifetime of investment, 30 years of investment. S start saving in your 30s, stop saving in your 60s, and try and live off the income is the assumption. And they give everybody in a, an audience like this computers for a day and ask them to make choices very simply between two portfolios, the snappily named A and B. They tell you nothing about those portfolios at the outset, and they recommend as a result, because you know nothing, that you split your money at the outset 50-50 after Harry Markovitz's diversification. And then they're told during the day, you will get updates representing the years of the 30 years, and you'll be given the opportunity, when you've seen how the two portfolios are performing, to change your 50-50 allocation if you want. What you're not told is that A is a high return but quite price volatile equity portfolio, and B is a much lower return but low volatility bond portfolio. And the exercise begins. The other thing you're not told is that the audience is split in half. Half the audience, I'll take it the one to the left as I look at it, are given an update every month during the 30 years. So they're given during the day 359 updates and 359 opportunities to change their position. The right side of the room, on the other hand, are only given data every five years. They're given five, year, five data points during uh, year five, 10, 15, 20, 25, and they can change their allocation five times only during the day. Every time that exercise is run, the people on this side of the room, the ones who only get five yearly updates, outperform the ones on this side of the room, the monthly updates, by compound returns that are twice as big basically, because on this side of the room with the monthly updates, sooner or later, the holding in the equity portfolio, the price does that and collapses. People sell it, then it does that and goes up, and they buy it back in. By the time they've been whipsawed like that once or twice during equity markets, and if you're going to invest for 30 years, you will be. Once they've done that once or twice, they start to gravitate in their allocation towards the wrong portfolio, the low return, low volatility portfolio. The people on this side who've got the five yearly updates can see yeah, that equity portfolio is very volatile, but over five years it's outperformed that other one, and so you start to allocate to the right portfolio. You start to ignore the short-term fluctuations and buy into the high-return portfolio. So I continue to say, frequency of information and decision is not your friend, it's your enemy. Anyway, that's what we thought was wrong with the world. At Fundsmith, which I set up in 2010, uh, we operate exactly the same strategy that we operated for the Tullet Pension Fund, which I gave you the background on at the beginning. We've got a very simple three-step strategy. We only invest in good companies. We try not to overpay. And then we do the most difficult thing of all, nothing. We sit on our hands. Uh, we only invest in good companies. You may be under the misapprehension that the vast majority of fund managers invest in good companies. Well, I was a broker for many years, and if they do, I must have met a very unusual set of fund managers, because I think they'll invest in any old rubbish, basically. Uh, we only invest in companies uh, which have got very long track records. Our average company was founded in 1902, uh, which have very consistently produced high returns on capital in cash have high gross margins, high net margins, and convert most or all of their profits into cash, uh, and which make their money selling a large number of everyday repeat predictable uh, events to you. People who make your everyday necessities and luxuries. Whenever you uh, buy some food or some drink or some snacks, when you buy toiletries or cosmetics, household cleaning products, when you ride up and down on an elevator or an escalator and it has to have a service interval, uh, when you uh, go to stay in a hotel that's franchised or go to a fast food franchise outlet, and when you go to the doctors and they use a low-tech disposable item on you, a syringe, a catheter, a sharp, a plate, a pin, those are the sort of things which we seek. Uh, in our fund. We try not to overpay. Um, why? Not just because we don't like overpaying, although we don't like overpaying. Um, it's because we're trying to buy and hold. We're trying to hold the companies and let those wonderful returns that they generate compound in value for our investors. We can't knowingly overpay in the way that people are overpaying now, in my view, for things like the dot-com-2 companies, in the hope that a bigger fool will come along later and pay even more for it. Um, we're not trying to buy something to sell it at a higher price later. Our ideal holding period is forever. 
So that's not the game we're trying to play. We're also rather acutely aware that we can't play greater fool theory for another reason. We probably are the greatest fool, you know? We, I don't think we're clever enough to be able to play that game. Frankly, looking at the results of it, neither does anybody else. They just haven't figured that out yet. And then we try and do nothing. If we've got that portfolio assembled of very good companies, we try and do nothing. Um, what have we achieved so far? We've actually got about 1.8 billion under management today, I think, uh, uh, in terms of the number. Those are the performance statistics you see there. Since inception, uh, we're up 64%. The market, that's the MSCI in sterling with dividends reinvested, is up 41.4%. If you annualize it, we're up 15%. They're up 10.7%. Um, our performance, very typically, is very good in bad periods. You'll see in 2011, we were up 8.5% when the market was down nearly 5%. We own things that are very defensive. They do their very best work when times are bad. Uh, you know, you basically all probably still brushed your teeth this morning, however you're feeling about your, your, your financial condition. I hope you did. Um, and you know what? Uh, I, can, I can fairly firmly bet that 45% of you picked up a white tube with a red oblong on it and white writing in it. You didn't even think about the fact that it's Colgate. You can just tell from the way the tube is designed. And I know it's 45% of you because that's their share of the world toothpaste market. It's a very reliable product, basically. Um, we do slightly less well in very bullish conditions. In fact, I'm rather surprised that we outperformed at all. Um, quite often, I think that people, uh, when they're trying to select a fund manager, look for somebody who will, report, who will outperform in all reporting periods and all market conditions. I've been in, in work now in doing this for 40 years in one guise or another this year. It's quite a long time. I've never met such a human being. I don't think there is anybody who does that. Uh, I like cycling uh, and uh, enjoy, uh, you know, I'm one of those people who's uh, taken, I'm a mammal, a middle-aged man in Lycra, who's taken this up in later life, uh, proving, as, uh, as my other half tells me, that no man looks good in Lycra. Uh, I don't know what she's talking about. But um, uh, if you look at the Tour de France, which was run for 100 years last year, no rider has ever won the Tour by, riding, by winning every stage because they're very different. The peloton stages, the time trials, and the mounted stages require quite different physiology and tactics. Nobody is ever going to win every stage of the Tour de France. If you tried to win the Tour by winning every stage, you would fail. Um, ditto with fund managers. We at Fundsmith are trying to run and win for you, the effective Tour de France. We're trying to win over the long term. We're not trying to win in every, every reporting period. Ironically, as it happens, we do outperform in most reporting periods. If you look back to the, um, uh, the pension fund, we've actually outperformed every year that we've had control of that as well. But typically, it's this kind of pattern. We outperform about 80% of down months. That's when our real good work is done. Um, just want to talk about emerging markets for a moment. Um, a lot of people have alighted in the last decade or so on the fact that the emerging markets represent a, a big opportunity. If you take the, uh, the IMF 2014 GDP growth forecast for what it's worth, I would particularly use it, but uh, uh, you've got to use something in the world. You'll see that when you look at the, uh, the high growth bits, which are basically the blue bits here, uh, it, it's bits of the world here. Uh, and when you look at the very low growth bits, it's bits in there and there. Uh, so yeah, there's no doubt about where GDP growth has been strongest in the last two decades, um, and where, at least if you believe the forecast, it will continue to be uh, strong. So armed with that, quite a lot of investors, possibly including some of you over the last decade or so, have gone, well, I'll have some exposure to emerging markets. Um, how's that gone, I wonder? Well, here's the, uh, uh, the Investment Management Association Global Emerging Markets Average. If you'd done that for the last five years, you'd be up 65.7%. Uh, if you've chosen one, uh, an average active fund in the, in the uh, IMA. So it's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, good. 65 over five years. Um, well, it's not that good, because if you take the MSCI index, that's up 69%. So you'd been better off buying the index. Well, no shock there, given what I was saying earlier, that the active managers have underperformed the index, because, you know, uh, as in any other sector of the market, they hug the index and charge you for it. So oh, you'd, have been, you'd have been OK if you bought the index. So you'd have had 69%. That's pretty good, isn't it? So that'd have been OK. Well, not really, because actually, if you bought the S&P over that period, you'd have had 123%. And if you'd have had the FTSE, you'd have had 101%. So maybe this emerging market lark isn't so good after all, basically. Why would you do it? Now, I actually think there is an opportunity in emerging markets, but I think analyzing what you would have got if you bought those index tells you the problem. That's the main constituents of the MSCI EM index, by country, by the top 10 companies, and by sector. So if you look at the top 10 companies, you've got a, a Korean electronics company, a Taiwanese semiconductor company, a Chinese internet company, a Chinese bank, a Russian gas and oil company, a Chinese bank. In my view, many of these companies are uninvestable. Uh, I wouldn't own shares in a bank in the UK. 
the, the idea of owning shares in a Chinese bank is mind-blowing. Uh, the accounting is a, is a pure work of fiction. Why would you ever do that? I can't get it. And if you look at the breakdown by, by type of, uh, of industry, you know, given what I've described we will invest in at Fundsmith, which is not the only way of investing in the world, but I would never own any financials. I wouldn't own most information technology. I don't understand it. It's too fast moving. You can be blindsided by developments. I certainly wouldn't own any energy companies, any material companies. I wouldn't own any consumer discretionary companies, nothing like car manufacturers wouldn't do that. If you're feeling hard up, you can just keep your car. I was in a, a Skoda taxi in Barcelona the other day. I said to the chap, how long have you had this? He said, well, I've done 235,000 miles. I just keep the oil topped up, that's it. You know, it's not a good that you can, uh, that needs replacement every day, like your toothpaste. If you're feeling hard up, keep your Skoda, it will keep going. Um, oh yeah, that's the bit I would own, consumer staples. The only bits of this index I would own is the consumer staples and the healthcare. I would only own about 10% of it. I think the rest of it is uninvestable, basically. If you look by country, you're supposed to buy emerging markets. China, South Korea is an emerging market. South Korea's GDP per capita is about the same as Spain. It's not an emerging market. Uh, Taiwan, ditto, is not an emerging market. I mean, if, uh, if, uh, if anything, Spain is emerging in the other direction. So uh, it's basically underperformed the, the developed world because the index is weighted towards things that I don't think you should ever own. Um, anyway, you might have said, well, look, the active funds haven't done very well. I'll buy the index. Oh, the index doesn't do very, hasn't done very well. I'll buy a brick fund. The bricks, after all, that's, those are the, according to Mr. O'Neill, the economic powerhouses of, uh, of the 21st century. What if you bought a brick fund? Well, you can see, then you would have had the worst performance of all. 43.6%, uh, worse than the active funds, worse than the index, worse than the developed world. Why is that? People, why, why was it so bad? Um, there's a concept called economic freedom where a body called the Heritage Foundation tries to do a factor model every year in which they gauge countries' investability based upon uh, data like corruption, uh, bureaucracy, ease of starting a business, uh, taxation system, property rights, intellectual property rights. And when they run it every year, you can tell that it's roughly right because the top 12 countries are always pretty much the same. It's always places like Hong Kong and Singapore. Some of the old uh, um, Commonwealth countries do very well, like Australia, uh, Canada, New Zealand, which I'm associated with, as, as the intro said, Switzerland, unsurprisingly. Uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the Scandinavian countries that are not addicted to big government do quite well. The United States gets a look in and so on. So most of the countries in the top 10, there are one or two surprising countries if you don't study uh, the geopolitics very well, like Mauritius and Chile, which might cut you out. But clearly they're roughly right that those are countries which have got systems which are very good for investors, basically. How are the BRICs? Well, the highest placed BRIC is Brazil, 114. I think out of 186. So it's not doing very well. India is 120th. China is 137th and Russia is 140. So if you bought a brick fund in the last few years, you were buying into countries that ranked there in terms of economic freedom. Doesn't sound like a good start. Just to show you how bad it is, I've compiled a, a list of countries which are quite close to the BRICS and said, so if you were willing to invest on this snappy acronym in the BRICS, notwithstanding the fact that they're terrible from an economic freedom standpoint, might you have been happy to invest in this alternative fund where I've selected countries which are better than the BRICS but quite close to them? So, you know, either Uganda or Moldova, which rank just above Brazil, uh, Greece, which ranks just above India, Suriname, for those of you who don't know where that is, it's in South America between Guyana and French Guyana. Uh, those are the countries which I've selected which rank just above the BRICS. Would you have been willing to invest in a fund which was a blended weighting of the stock markets of Uganda, Moldova, Greece and Suriname? I don't think you would. But if you had, we could have come up with a really snappy acronym because we could have got you into our mugs fund, basically. Don't invest in places on the basis of snappy acronyms, right? It's just not going to work. Um, and that's what's happened with people who followed the BRICS, and it'll happen with people who do Mint, which is the latest in incarnation, or the CVETs. You actually have to do some analysis about what, what lies beneath you're investing in. There is actually, in my view, though, an opportunity in emerging markets. There's a, a graph there with two lines, the, uh, uh, the, the pale blue one being the developed world, the, the heavy blue one being the emerging world, and you can see 
uh, extrapolation, as I'm about to say later, is a very dangerous tool, uh, particularly in this area of endeavour. But you can see in terms of the balance of GDP, there's a reasonable prospect at some point that more of the world's GDP will come from what we now regard as the developing world than the developed world. And you can see the opportunity that exists, in my view, in terms of investment, when you look at the weightings. The dark blue countries, the, the developing world, have the, the biggest share of the population, mobile phone subscriptions, forex reserves, motor vehicle sales, and so on. They have uh, direct investment. They have the majority of it. They have the majority of exports just. They're just about equal on fixed investment. But they're below us in a number of things. Reta things that I would like, retail sales, the capitalization, the value of their stock markets, their consumer spending. So things that I might like to invest in, they're actually underweighted in, unsurprisingly, given the, the, uh, uh, the, the relative poverty that they have compared to the developed world, they're somewhat underweighted in those. Perhaps if their GDP is going to overtake us, that bar chart may begin to look different in the years ahead. Um, and the opportunity is definitely, I rather like this chart, which is, uh, you can see here, we say, well, the, uh, the developing markets have 85% of the world's uh, population, 50% of its GDP, but only 9% of its stock market valuation. I wonder if that's going to change over time. And this helps you. This, this takes the market value of various companies and tells you what the equivalent valuation of develop, uh, in market stock markets is. So Procter & Gamble is worth the same as Russia. OK, uh, basically, um, if we look over here, we've got Nestle is the same as India. Uh, Burger King is Egypt, uh, Google is Brazil, and so on and so forth. It, it just gives you one of those anecdotal feels that there might be a shift compared to the valuation of those developed world companies, which are huge, and the very low valuation of the developing world over time. Um, we're um, at Fundsmith going to launch uh, an emerging markets fund in the next month or so. Uh, we've been planning it for quite a while, but the thing that really got us to, uh, to get our planning into gear to do it at this point was that we actually thought there was going to be a problem in emerging markets, which I think has emerged, uh, no, sorry, no, no, has arrived, I should think of another word than emerged at that point, I? in the last year. Uh, and one of the things that triggered my thinking was a piece of research that I read which had that cartoon on it. Now, I like this because um, it was timely. It was uh, almost exactly this time last year, so before we had a, a bit of a meltdown in emerging markets. Um, uh, it was timely and it had a cartoon, which meant I could understand it, basically, which is good. Um, and it's called the deflationary hot potato. And it tells you what was about to happen in emerging markets. The three desks you see there are, that one is, uh, is the Fed, Mr. Bernanke, in 2008. And, and the, the script behind it is the financial crisis strikes, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, opens his textbook and it says, to avoid a deflationary uh, depression, what you've got to do is print money and trash the currency. And that's exactly what he did. And in so doing, he sent uh, this deflationary hot potato uh, from, uh, from his action soaring through the air. And in 2010, it landed primarily on the desk of the ECB, the European Central Bank, and the Eurozone crisis broke. And the Eurozone periphery, the so-called pigs, went into a deflationary depression and meltdown. Now, they've taken quite a lot longer to get their act together in Europe because, uh, well, they just do, and, uh, and a number of other factors, like they haven't got a real central bank. It's not, not actually got the same powers as the Fed. But they have eventually done something, mainly talk about it. Um, and this was in May 2013. That deflationary hot potato was then soaring through the air and about to land there. And it's landed, basically. The, uh, the deflationary impact of the financial crisis has finally arrived in China and India and all of the countries that supply them basically. Uh, and I think that's created an opportunity for us. Uh, this piece of research, which was published last year, didn't get much publicity, which is probably unsurprising given its less than snappy title, Asia Foria Meet Regression to the Mean. But uh, one of the two authors on it was Larry Summers, who was the former US Treasury Secretary. And it basically said, when you're looking at emerging markets, there are three important points to bear in mind. Mean regression, not extrapolation, uh, characterize the growth rates. In other words, if they've been growing like that, don't just draw the line like that. Right? Do not expect that to continue indefinitely. Probably true of most things, but more so true in emerging markets because he says in the second point, emerging market growth is subject to episodic slowdowns. Uh, because it's a little bit less stable, because the middle class is more fragile, because it doesn't have the institutions, you'll find that the slowdowns when they come are typically more dramatic than, the, than we've had on average in the developed world. In the last 20 years, there have been three 50% drawdowns or, or loss of value in emerging markets as a result of that. Um, and then he points out, finally, against that background, China and India growth has been long and fast by historical standards. In other words, he's saying, 
don't keep extrapolating this, and it is due for a correction, and I think we're now having that correction. And that correction is what we're hoping to invest our new fund into. Um, we think there's an opportunity looming in it. That's the cyclically adjusted, or CAPE, earnings, so the, uh, the, the across-the-cycle earnings for emerging markets. And you can see uh, over the last 20 years, there's, been, there's those drawdowns that I was talking about there, the three of them, uh, in the late 90s, in the early 2000s, and in the financial crisis there. If you look at this, we're on our way towards one of those lows. I don't think we've got there yet, um, but it's certainly looking like an opportunity is looming uh, in emerging markets. Um, and the bit that looms best for us is the bit that we would do in our main fund, consumer staples. You can see I've blown up a part of that chart and I've overlaid the consumer staples into it. So there's the 2008 drawdown in emerging markets, but the blue line is the consumer staples. And you can see, rather like our main fund, the emerging markets consumer staples don't go down as badly, which is very good when, you, uh, when you're looking for defensive qualities, and they do tend to outperform, basically. They are hooked into one of the few long-term, genuinely predictable trends, I think, in the world, and that is the emergence of a consumer class in the emerging markets. So when, uh, depends whose research you read, but when uh, a consumer in the emerging markets goes through an income level of somewhere around five to $7,000 per annum, uh, just to put that in context for you, we're talking about $15 to $20 per day. Right? When they go through that, they become consumers. They start to want some... Before that, mostly they can't afford to be consumers. Their focus is about whether they've got enough to eat, whether their house is and home is secure, whether their water is sanitary, and all of the very basic things that we don't have to worry about. Once they go through that, they start to want sauce on their food so that it tastes better. They start to want some convenience in their food, even if it's only instant noodles, because the reason they're becoming more prosperous is because their country is industrializing and they have a job in a factory. They can't spend their entire time sourcing and preparing food any longer, any more than we can. And so all of those things begin to cut in, and it's one of the very, very few reliable long-term trends in the world that I think you can play. Um, so our fund will do things like this, some of which you may have heard of, some of which you may never have heard of. Jollibee, which is a uh, Philippine-based uh, fast food uh, company. Godredge, which is one of the leading Indian uh, personal care products, particularly hair oil. Um, I mean, there are some wonderful factoids about emerging markets. A third of all the world's hair by volume is in the Indian subcontinent. If you're interested in investing in hair products, and I am, uh, India is the place to look. Uh, culturally, because of the use of the products, but also simply the volume of hair uh, that's there. Grupo No Treza, which is the leading Colombian uh, food products company, uh, its biggest product uh, is a sort of a trademark product that's the equivalent of Nutella, uh, a chocolate spread. Vina Milk, which is the uh, Vietnamese uh, milk uh, uh, and dairy products company. Uh, Guinness, Nigeria, you may or may not be aware that the biggest market for Guinness in the world is Ireland? Nope. The UK? No. Nigeria. Nigeria, the biggest consumer of Guinness in the world. Jubilant Food Works, which is the, uh, the Indian franchisee for Domino's Pizza, uh, and the second biggest franchise of the world for them, the biggest being here in the UK. Nestle, Pakistan, Hindustan, Libra. Those are the sort of companies that will benefit from these, uh, from these mega trends. Uh, lastly, People often say with our main fund, um, well, look, I could do that myself. I, I, most of the companies you invest in are things I've heard of, and uh, uh, it's not that difficult to spot a good company, and I can do it myself. And you know what? You can. I think that's absolutely right, you can. I've got to say, most of the people that we found that have tried to do it themselves uh, end up back with us for a very simple reason, that there's the, the part of the discipline that they can't seem to stick to is not finding good companies or, or even not overpaying. It, it's not, not fiddling with the portfolio is the thing that seems to let them down, unsurprisingly. Um, but you can't do it with this emerging markets theme. Uh, we tried all of the, uh, the um, private client brokers uh, down on the left-hand side, Killick, Schwab, Hargreaves, Lansdowne, Waterhouse, and, and Barclays stockbrokers, uh, and asked them, could, they, could we open an account with them to, uh, to deal in any of those companies that I've had on the, on the previous slide? So Hindustan, Lever, Nestle, Malaysia, Colgate, Pakistan, East African Breweries, which is a uh, subsidiary of Diageo, and Group in And as you can see, the answer is a universal no. Uh, and I might say, if you do find somebody who gives you a yes, before you deal, you should probably ask a follow-up question, which is, how much will that cost? Because I think you'll find it's a bit different to dealing in a FTSE 100 company. So if there is an opportunity there, and I think there is, that's what we intend to capture. It's exactly the same strategies we use in our main fund, only investing in good companies, not overpaying, and as I say, most importantly, and it's a, an important thing for you as well as me, 
doing nothing. It's the most difficult part, in my view, of a successful investment strategy. Thank you.